Okay, I'm going to talk to you about truth and concealment. History presents itself as an attempt to tell us something about the past. But in fact, it hardly do so. In most cases, it is there to conceal our shame. This is very important to understand. For instance, Jewish history hardly tell us what really happened in the past or try to explain us why Jews suffer. What it does, it tries to conceal the fact that wherever Jews go, a disaster is about to happen. Look at Jewish history. It's an endless chain of holocausts. But Jews are not alone. Palestinians, after 100 years of Palestinian struggle, national struggle, they achieved nothing. Palestinian history is an attempt to conceal this very embarrassing fact. What about the Brits? British, you know about them, they, they used to be here as well. Um, and they tried to conceal it. Brits got a lot of genocides to their names. But you won't find any of those genocides in any British museum. In the British, uh, in the British imp imp Imperial Wars Museum, they dedicated a full floor to genocide, but it's the Nazi Holocaust. And what about you? You have a Holocaust a museum pretty much in every capital, which is an attempt to conceal the pain that you inflicted on other people. It is very simple. But how does it happen? How does it take place? Who manages the concealment? Who takes care of it? This is a big question. In order to understand this question, I'll talk about Palestine and the Palestinian solidarity discourse. I believe that a lot of people here support Palestine. And I'm going to annoy you. I'm very good at it. I make a living out of it. <laughs> but it is very embarrassing. And, it's, and we, I, I believe that the way to improve the situation, our situation, the situation in Palestine, around the world, is to start to understand how concealment works. We will look now into each of the Palestinian solidarity main terms that we employ when we look into this conflict. Zionism. Just before I spoke, there was a lady who spoke about Zionism. Zionism has very little to do with Israel. Sounds surprising. In case people you don't know, Zionism was the promise to bring the diaspora Jews to Palestine and to establish a Jewish state. A Jewish state was established in 1948, and since then, Israelis are not concerned with Zionism. I was born in Israel. We don't, we didn't know, we don't understand what Zionism is. Zionism is very significant for diaspora Jews, because it allows them to identify with Israel or to identify with, his, with, it, with its opposition. But for Israelis, it doesn't mean a thing. So you tell an Israeli, I'm an anti-Zionist. So oh, this is, this is, and what do you have for breakfast? It, they don't understand what is the problem. <laughs> Why do we use the word Zionism because Israel, in fact, defines itself as the Jewish state. And it puts Star of David on its airplanes and tanks. So if we really want to understand what Israel is, we have to ask what is the meaning of the Jewish state? What is the meaning of Jewishness? 
But asking this question, something that I do all the time, really offends the Jews. And the last thing that we want to do is to offend the Jews. <laughs> to offend the Jews, it's a, it's a suicidal attempt. So we speak about Zionism. We lie to ourselves, to the Palestinians, and to our listeners. It's a myth. Colonialism. We like to call Israel, Israel is a colonialism, Zionism is a colonialist movement. No, no, nonsense. Colonialism, as you know very well, is a clear material exchange between a mother state and a settler state. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, I am right. In Israel, it is a settler state, but where is mommy? No mommy. Ma now we have kind of a bit for, for a while, uh, American mommy, before we had French, British, you know. In colonialism, you cannot kind of change your mommy every three, three weeks. It's not colonialism. It has nothing to do with colonialism. It is a unique project of people who come back after 2,000 years and say, sorry, you have to move, I, I've been here before. Quite unusual. I live, in, in, I live in, 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 in Britain. I still don't speak English, but I managed to memorize a lot of text. <laughs> I live in Britain, and I asked myself one day, what would have happened if a bunch of Italian lunatics settle in Piccadilly Circus <laughs> and start to, to dig and to build and, you know, and after a week, some people thought, what are you doing? You know, it's traffic jam. This is the center. They said, we are the Italians, the Romans. We, we come back. <laughs> they wouldn't get away with it. <laughs> so why do we call Israel colonialism? Because we don't want to offend the Jews. It's very, no, we really don't want to offend the Jews. If we call it, if we call it for what it is, the Jews would be devastated. They much prefer to be like Britain, France, uh, Portugal, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch. But no, the Jewish settlement project is a unique project that is driven by racist inclinations, nationalism, Religious, religious uh, we can talk about uh, religion. It's quite complicated to understand because it's an atheist movement. In fact, it is very similar to Nazi expansionism. Now, if you say that the truth, it's really going to offend the Jews. Another nonsense, apartheid. Apartheid is a very system of exploitation that is driven by clear racist intent or racist ideology. But Israel is not apartheid. They don't want to, expo to exploit the Palestinians. They want them out. Yes. Israel is an ethnic cleanser. Israel is an ethnic cleanser, racist, ethnic cleanser, driven by, driven by nationalist ideology. It is very similar to the Nazi ideology. But we cannot say it, because we would offend the Jews. The Jews. You don't, also don't want to offend the Jews. I, I, listen, I was a Jew, and I'm happy to be offended. Now, it is very important sometimes to tell the truth because if you want to improve the world we are living in, truth is of the essence. And it is also very important to tell the truth to the Jews because this is the only way to save them from making mistakes. It's not that we want to offend them. Truth 
is at the core of Western thinking. This is why you are so great in America. When you used to tell the truth, you, 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 you knew how to make cars. <laughs> okay, but how did it happen to us? Is there anyone in the room that is not offended yet? <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting to you. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. How did it happen to us? How is it possible that our intellectual in the movement and activists are all misleading themselves, misleading their listeners, engage in a discourse that is all based on false terminology. It's quite painful. By the way, we can talk about America. Your entire progressive discourse is also misleading. And I'm here for four talks, and every day I will deconstruct another discourse. I really looked into it. And I think that I know where the problem is. In the right, or within the right political discourse, traditionally, we have a clear dichotomy between scholarship and activism. What is activism? Activism is an attempt to make our world a better place, to introduce a social change. It's a beautiful thing. What is scholarship? Is an attempt to reach at the bottom of things, the truth. In the new left discourse, in the progressive discourse post-1968 revolution, there is no dichotomy between the activists and the scholars. If you look at your leading uh, progressive activists like Chomsky or whatever, they call themselves activists. This is the problem. Once this dichotomy is blurred, we start to compromise on the truth. Oh, but you know, we don't want to offend. We all the time, we try to reach new allies. I always, every day, I try to reach new enemies. <laughs> Dedicated. I come to a place, you don't know me, I don't know you, and I try to annoy you. <coughs> That's the way I work. I'm a jazz artist, I play unlistenable music. And I make the career out of it. And by the way, I have a concert tonight, no? Jason, is it tonight, the concert? Yeah. I brought my saxophone, saxophone, I thought maybe in the end, if you are not so sure that you are coming, I will play one tune and I'll convince you. <laughs> now, I'm not an activist and I, do, I, I, I put two, two of my phones to make sure that I kind of talk for 25 minutes, but I forgot to see when, when I started. <laughs> I really want to make it very clear, and, and, and then we will have time for questions and to, to uh, delve on all those issues that Rich discussed. And how do we move forward? How do we move forward? Activism, pickets, demonstrations, no. All this culture of demonstrations and pickets achieved nothing, Great. nothing, and for a reason. How can, it achieve, how can it achieve anything if we don't even shout the truth? So four million uh, gather in central London to protest against the war, massive number, and a week later, Britain is taken into a war, and three months later we realized that we killed one million innocent Iraqis, and nobody comes to the street. Because they were not genuine. We can move forward. It is very simple. 
There is one reason that you cannot tell the truth, and this is actually in conflict with your constitution, with the First Am Amendment. To be American is to be able to tell the truth. It's a shame that you get kind of an Israeli Brit to tell you that this is, this is what it means. Your biggest enemy in this country is political correctness. What is political correctness? Political correctness is a political stand that doesn't allow political opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly the definition of dictatorship. But political correctness is far worse than dictatorship. Because in a dictatorship, you know that you don't like Hitler, or Stalin, or Benjamin Netanyahu. But in political correctness, it is you. It is you who suppress yourself. It's a self-castration. The only way forward, and this is the only way forward, is to dig and to understand what is it that made this country into a great country. And this is the fir First Amendment, freedom of speech. The ability to stand up and to say what you think. So if it's not Zionism, it is the Jewish state, you have to stand up. And if your labor production is kicked out of the window and you want to understand why it happened, this was the most productive country on this planet and it isn't anymore. You have to ask yourself, why? Who were the people? Don't try to offend anyone. You're helping yourself and you're helping the people who actually dismantled your economy. This is your duty as people. Last year, and this is why I want to end, last year, in June, I gave a talk in Ann Arbor. For many years I wanted to visit Detroit. I've been there in the 80s and it, it wasn't, I'm a musician, you know, it was a very special experience for me. Ann Arbor, 30 miles from Detroit, 25 minutes. A friend took me. It is the most devastating place I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Ann Arbor or Detroit? And Detroit, Detroit, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Ann Arbor is pretty much the opposite. It is the most devastating place on this planet. It is actually far more devastating than Gaza. Because in Gaza, there is life. Life under occupation, oppression. But in Detroit, there is no life. It is dead. And it's about time to understand that we are all Palestinians. Now, why we can't see it? Because for some reason, and I'll talk about it in the next talks, I, I don't want to drift too, too far from Palestine. We were trained to think as a. When I grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the left told us that it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or black or Muslim or woman, a lesbian, gay. What matters? is your role within the production chain. So if you work in a factory, we're all the same. But not anymore. The new left 
taught us to speak as a, as a Jew, as a Muslim, as a lesbian, as a black. They took our society and they spliced us into identities. Instead of looking into the most important thing, which is production. Production. We fight for hours like sectarian wars that are, have zero interest for the nation. Gay marriage, who cares about it? They want to get married, get, what? it's none of our business. What we want is to work. Palestine. The people in, Ar in Ann Arbor in the night, they told me, Gilad, we want you to speak about Palestine. I asked them, why do you want me to talk about Palestine? Palestine, I don't know, is it 12,000 miles from here? Detroit is just 30 miles. Let's talk about Detroit. Why didn't you care for Detroit as much as, as, as you care to, for Palestine? These are your neighbors. This was a liquidation of class, of a productive class. Many blacks, Hispanics. And I realized that the biggest danger with Palestine is that it became a solidarity pet. Instead of really caring for humanism wherever we are, they gave us kind of a solidarity. We go, we put flags, we blah, 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 blah and we care about something 12,000 miles. All the time, we are brought down. Once we understand that humanism is being one people, we start to move forward. And it can be done. You are here today, I guess, because you somehow understand it and maybe don't know how to express it. That's it. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about truth and concealment. History presents itself as an attempt to tell us something about the past. But in fact, it hardly do so. In most cases, it is there to conceal our shame. This is very important to understand. For instance, Jewish history, how did tell us what really happened in the past or try to explain us why Jews suffer? What it does, it tries to conceal the fact that wherever Jews go, a disaster is about to happen. Look at Jewish history. It's an endless chain of holocausts. But Jews are not alone. Palestinians, after 100 years of Palestinian struggle, national struggle, they achieved nothing. Palestinian history is an attempt to conceal this very embarrassing fact. What about the Brits? British, you know about them, they, they used to be here as well. Um, and they tried to conceal it. Brits got a lot of genocides to their names. But you won't find any of those genocides in any in terms that we employ when we look into this conflict. Zionism, just before I spoke, there was a lady who spoke about Zionism. Zionism has very little to do with Israel. Sounds surprising. In case people you don't know, Zionism was the promise to bring the diaspora Jews to Palestine and to establish a Jewish state. A Jewish state was established in 1948, and since then, Israelis are not concerned with Zionism. I was born in Israel. We don't, we didn't know British Museum. In the British, uh, in the British Imp Imp War Imperial Wars Museum, they dedicated a full floor to genocide 
but it's the Nazi Holocaust. And what about you? You have a Holocaust a museum pretty much in every capital, which is an attempt to conceal the pain that you inflicted on other people. It is very simple. But how does it happen? How does it take place? Who manages the concealment? Who takes care of it? This is a big question. In order to understand this question, I'll talk about Palestine and the Palestinian solidarity discourse. I believe that a lot of people here support Palestine. And I'm going to annoy you. I'm very good at it. I make a living out of it. <laughs> but it is very embarrassing. And, it's, and we, I, I believe that the way to improve the situation, our situation, the situation in Palestine around the world, is to start to understand how concealment works. We will look now into each of the Palestinian solidarity